Hello everyone and welcome to This Is Your Teaching Life, a podcast about ordinary teachers and their not-so-ordinary jobs. Join co-hosts Josh Simpson and Steve Crow as they explore the journey and experiences of everyday teachers, coaches and educators. Discover tips, tricks and advice as you listen to stories from everyday people who dedicate their lives to one of the world's most intricate, challenging and rewarding jobs, teaching. This is Your Teaching Life. G'day everyone and welcome to another episode of This Is Your Teaching Life. Josh and I are very, very excited to be here today with the one and only great Rick Mirabella. How you going, Rick? Crowley, what a bloody privilege it is. I love it in here. We're, we're, for anyone listening, of course, everyone who's listening, we're in a very tight little setting, aren't we, boys? Just at the back we of are. my studio here, Crowley's just filmed one of the all-time greatest running <laughs> strength videos you'll ever do. 25 minutes of absolute quality gold. And then Simo's rocked up, and we've just come out the fact in this little, where are we? What would you call it? It's a crevice. Oh, it's a nice little office here. Oh, great, right, cool. Great office decked out with all your Geelong merchandise behind us, which is nice. Yeah, I do like it. It's the only spot I've got for my man cave, so it's very it's very good. Shelly won't let me put it up at home, so it's nice. <laughs> now, Rick, we've got you on because you're one of our first, I suppose, um, non-teachers per se. You are a teacher in your own right, but you're an educator and... Um, with the runner system, it's something that I've been using for a while, and it's something that's going really well. I know lots and lots and lots of people use it, so we had to chat about all things coaching, mate. And um, yeah, but for those people who don't have the luxury of knowing you as well as I, I do, <laughs> give it's us a nice adjective. T- tell the uh, people out there who you are, mate, and what runners is all about. Thank you, Crowy, and thank you for calling me an educator. That's that's a marvelous, a marvelous compliment. Now, look, yeah, I um. I guess with runner's system or running coach, I've been a running coach for over 15 years now and that would be my major qualification um, and strength and conditioning stuff as well. So started runners at the start of 2007 um, and the product hasn't really changed too much as far as um, I guess the nucleus of it and it's just purely a coaching system devised for all humans but to help them run better from 5K to the marathon, and it's just interval training, but every week we, we mix this the program up. Um, I don't want to get too much into the science right now, but I guess that the biggest niche that we found early days was in 06, uh, when I kind of started doing this stuff, was running can be a very intimidating thing for people, um, and if you're not already, if you haven't already had some experience or you've you got some talent or whatever it may be, it's just something that people just put and it's far too hard basket but I I understood psychology and physiology that they, it's just all about continuity and we had to get at least one or two of these sessions in a week to continue to improve now they're only 40 minutes in nature so what I thought I'd do back then as a young fella in my early 20s would I brought it indoors so um, and I used the perceived rate of exertion scale uh, which I guess is very common in in um, physiology literature but I just wanted to make it simple for people so if you had um, Let's use, and I use time. Time was another one. I didn't. I think meters can scare people. If you say, "Oh, crow, we're going to go and do six times yeah. eight hundred. Um, I started to use time because the body doesn't understand kilometers. The body doesn't understand miles. It, that's all arbitrary. It understands time under tension. So, from you, how is Crowy going to get better over ten k? We need to improve his stroke volume, his left ventricle size. Um, science talk, but his capillaries and mitochondria around his muscle fibers, and he's got to get more economical at running fast. But if Crowy doesn't do eight to ten weeks continuous, because he doesn't feel like he's fast enough to keep up with someone at the track or it's intimidating or other stuff, um, he's not going to get fitter or he's not going to continue to get better. So I guess a long-winded answer, but I brought it indoors just so we could, it's all inclusive, non-judgmental. You can have a 8 year old debutante runner next to an AFL footballer next to a marathoner, all running at their own perceived rate of exertion and it's a synced it really quickly. Let's say a speed endurance session, I've got six times 90 second efforts with a minute off, let's just use that number. Um, Simo could have his 90 second efforts it's at 90% I've used 90% Simo might be at 12k an hour or 5 minute kilometres Crowy might be at 13 this or is on the treadmill this is on the treadmill in, initially in the old days uh, Crowy might be at 13k be using the Garmin as well at 430s or whatever um, the, the lady I spoke of might be power walking at 6k an hour um, and that's her 90% effort because it is because 90% you can't really talk um, the marathon might be at 16k an hour might have someone else training for weight loss trying to hold eight and a half k an hour and it just was a instantly a really inclusive environment um and i always uh from a footy background with yourself crowy um i just wanted to make the most footy and team environment i could possibly make it as far as no judgment no egos 
but also have everyone improving. So you did need that endurance physiology side of it, which, yeah, so that's, that's the, and then we've turned it into the app, obviously, over the last five, six years. So and now everyone can do it. doesn't matter where they are, outdoors, indoors, or wherever they are in the world. So that is a very long-winded answer. <laughs> So it's yeah, it's really cool. Like uh, you know, what you've really developed is a community as well, haven't you? So anyone can come in, do the running on the treadmill like they did in the past. One, you can take it outside, like you said, at your own level. So you're not comparing comparing to anyone else, which is like a big thing in, I suppose, any any field, I suppose. And um, yeah, it's well, yeah, comparisons are thief for joy, as they say. And I guess we don't realise that until we we know that we've been in it for so long. Sometimes, and it, it's it's. It's a privilege to run. It's a privilege to move. And too many people probably, um, look, life's hard enough. Like, why, why are we trying it? We shouldn't need to put another stress all on ourselves with running. And I guess I take away what I've done without knowing it back then, but obviously the last five or six years with the apps and, and runners, I've tried to take away decision fatigue as one. And as teachers, you both know about decision fatigue. We need to take <laughs> that right away from people, okay? Because at the end of the day, if, if I take away your anxieties and your stresses, then at least if, if the only reason that helps you to to listen to me is that you're going to perform better, well, you are. You're going to bloody perform better if you don't think. Just yeah. stop thinking, okay? And just do the session week on week, month on month, year on year. Every week's a different session, but that's not the point. It's about just continuing to get uncomfortable once or twice a week. Um, and if you're if I'm comparing to Crowey, I go, gee, Crowey ran 5K in this and I've got to get that. There's no way I'm going to improve because... It's not going to happen organically. You're trying to force a round peg through a square hole, um, and it just doesn't flow. So you just need to leave all that at the door, which I think works really well. And the community you speak to, um, we've got an online community, which is really good, and people support each other. It doesn't matter where they are in the world, via a private Facebook group, and Melbourne, Melbourne Arts, we do catch up, and, and that kind of stuff, which is really cool. And it's irrelevant if you're trying to run a Boston qualifier or if you're trying to run 5K for the first time. Um, everyone just respects everyone for where they are, which I think... It's nice that it's come full circle 15 years later. Yeah, it's good. No, it sounds awesome. I love the inclusive nature of that. Like you think about, you know, coming from a teacher background, you're always trying to include all the kids, but the program you've developed is, as you said, you're getting everyone in there, creating that community, which sounds amazing. Something that I picked up then you said that, you know, you don't want to compare yourself to other runners. <clears throat> and we've had a chat about this previously when we tried to do episode 1.0 with Rick and it didn't quite oh, hey, we should make tell, it. We, we should tell that story before you ask that question. Should we? <laughs> that was gold. Yeah. Well, do you want to share the story, Rick, on, oh, on what happened in episode 1.0? Oh, it was marvellous. Logos yeah. rocked up the crow. He's joined us. Uh, beautiful house. He's doing some renos and I brought we, some we beers. Teed it. Yeah, we teed it all up, didn't we? Yeah. It was a Friday Arvo from memory. We were going yeah. to have some beers. a beautiful afternoon. Life's great. Crow, I'm driving on the freeway. I'm only 25 minutes from where Crow lives and driving down there and, and, he, and he starts texting about Oh, don't rush, mate. I said, what's this, what's this about? Don't rush him. Like, That's cool. I'm not. He goes, yeah. And I get there, and it's like an industrial buddy. <laughs> it was a work site. It's like an industrial <laughs> commercial work site. I was looking for the union, actually. It was just people <laughs> everywhere. I go, what's going on? How are we going to record it? And he goes, oh, no, they'll be gone soon. They, they never left him. Oh. It was like 4, 4, 4.30 on a Friday. I'm not a tradie by any means, but I know a lot of tradies, and none of them were at that time. <laughs> none of our Friday, mates. We come from the same town, man, Crow. And none of our tradie mates from Somerville, there's no a chance <laughs> they're working past four o'clock on a Friday. Yeah, so I They were hard workers. I, they were. I stuffed it up, and we couldn't do the podcast no. recording, so it's great that we're here today. So. <laughs> it was very, very funny. We had a few beers and had a good chat, and I got to meet Simo, which is which That's was it. one of life's great privileges. <laughs> well, no, that was, that was a funny day or afternoon, but... In that afternoon, we were chatting about Strava, and you saw it, like, because I've only recently got in Strava, I know you, and Crowley did as well last year during the lockdown, but you mentioned, like, you don't love it because people can't compare themselves and fall into that trap of comparing themselves to others. Do you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, look, Strava's a great tool, and it's an amazing digital device, but too many people, I think, yeah, especially in the first three or four years of running, but it depends where they're coming from, I guess, as well, but they just, yeah, they've, it's a, it does have a massive negative influence, and it speaks to that negative narrative I spoke of. If you're going out for a runner's session or, or a a 400 a 10 times 400 or a fart leg session um and you're thinking about what it's going to say on strava um it, it really does release negative neurotransmitters negative hormones and your run's not going to be number one is enjoyable okay like it's your time running should be your time whether you do our sessions running cycling cross trainer or your own interval stuff whatever it's your time like away from work kids away from other stuff so why am i thinking about trying to beat crowy over over a 1k rep there is a time and a place, don't get me wrong, for that kind of stuff. We have got Strava, right? well, I use it for a training diary, but I do take a lot of written journal notes we can talk about later. But the Strava group, as long as it's there as a community, 
we've got a runners group on Strava, and I'm sure you know, I know you guys have got your teaching groups, and I've got two different footy groups on Strava. And as long as there is a supportive community, and I think as long as you go in it with the right mindset, um, it's really good. I think it's a really nice way to connect. I think it's really cool. Um, it's just it's a great way to connect, but there's a lot of negatives. So as long as people are, I guess, are empowered of those tools to say, well, no, no, I, I don't. I put my easy jogs on there all the time for that reason. I don't want to, like I, and I should be jogging at two minutes um, slower than 5K pace um, for, for an easy jog because otherwise I'm not going to regenerate. I'm not going to get better. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and with the runner sessions or the track sessions, I don't stop the watch really. So it just drags right out. And I want that. Uh, people who, unless you're doing a time trial or a race, that's the only time you should be looking at your actual yeah times on Strava and I think everyone would um, agree with that a lot of my guests that I've interviewed in the Olympic from like Mottram Stuart McSway and these guys the best runners Australia's ever seen Americans uh, Tom Swartz and that they're just elite American coaches and runners they don't look at their watch ever apart from a hard track session just for their own knowledge so if you if you look to these guys and the Kenyans we've got a couple of got Kichobi up on the wall here <laughs> but he, he doesn't look at his watch so he runs a marathon average in 255 kilometer splits which it sounds an inhuman but he's the fastest human on earth of all time but he'll still do his easy jogs in the high fours yeah. so i just think a lot of general pop that are type a especially need to probably take that in by all means use the use the um platform it's really good yeah. but please be aware that um back to that comparison thing and not to look at anything i guess it's like all forms of social network isn't it like um, yeah, absolutely. Please don't compare yourself to anyone because it's just it's it's fickle and it's not going to serve you at all. Yeah. Well, it helped you with your running last year for a bit, didn't it? Simply oh, absolutely. Like, like, like I'd never run ten k before, uh, and then you know you got the staff on it. I think oh no, or someone got the staff up, at yeah. school on it anyway, and uh, yeah, started running and finally knocked off ten k. But can certainly understand what you're saying there. Like it's so easy to ho- open it and look at it and be like, oh, Crowley's run. Yeah. This, oh, yeah. I'll go out and beat him. That definitely or, happened to me, I reckon. Especially yeah. when we're in lockdown and doing it and everyone was posting like every day. Yeah. I got to a certain amount amount of Ks for the week. And I thought, that's the benchmark now. I've got to keep doing it. And I broke down like probably a month later just from trying to overdo it just to get the number instead yeah. of actually enjoying yeah. it. Enjoying it. So the numbers, the num- back to the numbers. The numbers are arbitrary as well. But I totally understand. I can totally understand some kids playing bloody basketball so sorry guys I don't, it's not a basketball stadium brother um, no I can totally understand how it would motivate people I totally get it I can do, it's, it's human psychology so uh, Simo wanted to run his longest run ever I totally get that and there's segments on there that you want to try to get your, your local legend or your records and I tell you it's, it's, it's a great thing and I think we're talking to Strava but you can talk to anything in school yeah. anything in education um, system it, it's so normal but I like to have I like to use it and I say in some of the sessions, Crow, that like use motivation, when you're gonna use motivation the last five minutes or a particular rep of a session or a marathon or a 10K, whatever. But, um, keep going, get that kid to be quiet. Stop bouncing. No music's no. playing, boy. Stop yeah, mate. bouncing, bloody hell. Um, but you've got to, uh, this is a really important point. That's why it's just about coming back to your system and your process. And if we come back to the system, the system is I used to get this session done, I recover well, I regenerate, I improve, I super compensate, I get better. Um, education's the same thing. I can't be relying on Strava or motivation, quote unquote, the whole time because it's fickle and it's not going to last, number yeah. one. Number two, it's not conducive, as, as Crowley found out, he got injured. So we use it. We definitely take Strava or we take. Um, a competitive rivalry that we might have in a 5k, 10k, or a football rivalry uh, against another team, boys. We take that when we need to, absolutely. Like, I love that, I love the motivation side of it. But unfortunately, motivation counts for 1% of the week, maybe 2% of the week. It's gotta come back to the hardwired system process, come back to that, and then the motivation is so easy, because in the last quarter of a game, or the last 5k of a race, you can call on that. And it's, it's, like, it's like if you haven't had coffee for a week or two and you have a cafe and you're just bloody up and about, boys. You're just you're already on through brick walls. It's the same deal. If you're so hardwired that you haven't missed a beat, a session, a track session, a running session, a long run, you haven't missed, you you, you prepared well for your, your class, then you call on the big guns, the motivation. Or yeah. You say, oh, now I want to try to get my 5K under 20 minutes or whatever it may be. But I know I've gone off a couple of tangents, but I reckon that's probably, the whole, in a nutshell, what's pretty important to, to most things in life. 
Yeah, mate, we're super excited to have you on here, mainly because with all the media stuff that you do, you're a very you're very much a person who always asks questions about other people. Mm. And I've kind of gotten the hint that you try not you do you, you don't like to talk about yourself because you're a very modest man. So this is a great opportunity to find out a bit more about you. <laughs> not liking where this is going, Stephen. <laughs> it's all going to be especially because right? I just <laughs> took the piss out of him on camera for 25 minutes as well. But I was G-rated, so you keep it that way. So let's let's go back to you as a young kid, because I know you weren't you weren't always doing the running thing, and I think you're a, a landscape gardener by trade, um, I believe. But but even before that, Very like bad your, one. Your, your school school time, like what what's what was Rick Mirabel like <laughs> as a young kid? Did you have any sort of sporting achievements or just any childhood achievements that sort of bring to mind? Oh, uh, thanks, Curry. Uh, no, I, I always enjoyed sport. I always loved my footy and basketball, and always I was always an obsession and a passion, footy, basketball. Um, and endurance sport to a lesser extent. Like, I remember always watching the Hawaiian Ironman and that in primary school. And weirdly, because I obviously didn't get into that till my uh, 2021. But no, I definitely, um, I was, I wouldn't say I was a great student, but physiology was always a, um, a f- physiology, I'm going to go crazy on that. <laughs> yeah, so, hey, are you going to say? We'll be able to hear it. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> cut, cut that out if you heard the audio. Um, physiology and improving the human body was weirdly because I don't think people that knew me back then, uh, as you did, mate, or I did party extremely hard. And look, I still enjoy social occasions and, and, and getting out and letting letting my hair down. I did party very hard, but I probably had the scale very wrong. Like I, I probably was definitely not trained enough. Like I'd do footy training two nights a week um, and, and I probably a lot me enjoyed my strength back then. But even the strength, I was always trying to read more um, and I loved PE at school right the way through. Um, and definitely VCE PE, but again, no nowhere n- knew. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Like I had no idea. So you finished school in um, our town, uh, Somerville. Crowley went away to uni. I- I'd already been on the tools. I was a tradie. So I guess as a kid, I had a great life and a great family and great mates. But I was just it was all sport. And then what you do is get a trade. Yeah. And I'm not very um, good at any trades. Um, and I was lucky enough, someone just said, oh, you're doing this uh, lens. I said, yeah, bloody oath. I enjoyed the thought of it, and I did it for five years. And that five years, I was always trying to work out how I was going to get, because I always loved leadership. A mutual coach of ours, Paddy Swain, um, put me in charge of a couple of pre-seasons um, at Somerville. Um, I'd done a lot of leadership at school, uh, where footy leaders just coach, just taking training sessions. And I was like, well, how am I going to make money of this? And yeah, Chris McCarthy, who was a runner, Olympics and Commonwealth Games bronze medalist. He, he came out a couple of pre-season just sessions, and he invited me down to do some running work. And I guess I just found a bit of a natural, you know, it's not a, it's not a gift. It's more just a natural thing for working hard and and suffering. Um, and I guess I got really good really quick. And then I wanted to get better at that. Like, how do I get better at that? Um, and just oh, yeah, wait, sorry to cut you off. No, that's the, right. The Chris McCarthy thing because mm. he, he, yeah, like you said, he's a gun runner didn't he look look at you running at footy training and say mate i think you should spend more time running rather than yeah he, he invited me to come down and i did that and i because you were afraid like you like yeah taught yourself down but you were always well middle distance and long, yeah I, I i guess i could suffer a lot and uh, i guess from a running economy sense because uh, i did run a lot i guess my running economy naturally improved back then um but i don't think um yeah like like chris invited me down to have yeah a couple of sessions with him and, and that probably just lit the fire of wanting to learn more and back then it was probably the running was probably a bit more of a selfish thing or how do I get better um, at that young age but then um, already I just loved taking 45 humans in the summer or I just loved the idea of helping different people um, with their stuff whether it was trying to run a faster 5,000 or trying to just drop 15 kilos back then or that kind of stuff really really interested me so I started studying um, and look I did a lot for Athletics Australia. Did me basic cert three, cert four, and I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't. I certainly didn't. Um, I looked into getting a couple of undergrads back then. I just didn't have the the time. Like I was still working, so I just continued to, I guess, self educate myself, and um, and then I did a truckload of courses and and started coaching athletes on the track, and then brought it indoors in 07. So, and I guess the 07 factor, um, those few years was really good, really powerful, and then. Um, Shell, my wife was already doing some PA stuff for me because I, I, I was I was just a young bloke, man. I had no idea, so I, I got Shell to do some PA stuff. She was one of the first members of Runners, and then obviously we started dating and, and, and got married eventually. But with with that, we started really pushing this Runners stuff um, out, filming in about 2012. So we were already filming these sessions just because it was such a different such a different thing. 
um, we knew that it was quite unique. Um, we had it trademarked early. Um, it was all that kind of stuff. And there's always people that I was very, I guess, with the product, very, um, what's the word? I guess protective of the product back then, 10 years ago, because I knew it was very different. And then people would try to take it and rip you off. And lots of people yeah. did, lots of people did. Um, and obviously, you, you just got to forget about that. That's all old stuff and ego stuff and um, just organically just let it flow. And yeah, so we've been filming for nearly 10 years as well. We've done a lot of different apps and different products and we've finally settled on this one. It's really bloody good and we're really happy with it. But I've, I've really succinct to that, I hope, Stephen, or do you want to know anything more? <laughs> Well said, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's, it comes across that you're a very, you know, you know your stuff, you're very intelligent, you like to work hard, you said that, you push yourself a lot. Has that always been the way? It's something we like to ask is about yeah. your score. Was uh, that uh, horrible. the work hard throughout your time? No, nothing. So it's funny you asking that because they did a Padua thing. Me and Crow both went to Padua, um, and not many summer villains went to Padua, Crow, did they? Oh, um, anyway, we both did it. No, mate, I, unfortunately I didn't. I, I, did, I did well. I think I did. It was... It was thirty nine, mate. So I, I reckon I'll be a lowest end of score that you've had on this on this thing. Well, um, I don't um, think you are. Yeah. Well, anyway, thirty nine, and I, to be honest, mate, I just I was so there were some things where I was really relished and mature in some ways. But back then, and even now, people would still say I'm thirty eight, and I, I can be extremely mature at times. Um, yeah, I was very mature, mate. I, I did not put any work in, and I really enjoyed physiology. Um, and year 12 PE but apart from that I was never there I don't think after so I certainly didn't take a pen or a book so yeah. a very ordinary student but I love my teacher the teachers I, I think we had pretty good relationships um, I loved my time at, at my high school Padra and I loved all my teachers they were great and I think we got along really well um, but they couldn't possibly that doesn't mean anything in the exams does it <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't do anything I think I only had three or four subjects yeah. to, to cry but now I enjoyed school and I loved and, but now I really love learning. Like me and Crow, we talk a lot about professional development and I try not to go a day without learning something, whether it's in my field or not. Uh, lots of audio books, lots of podcasts, lots of lots of books. Um, we just spoke about this, but I do struggle to retain when reading unless it's yeah. really in my in my wheelhouse, whether it's endurance or, or distance running or essence, strength and conditioning. Apart from that, if it's not in that wheelhouse, I need it to be audio. I just yeah. need it to be like we spoke off, offline about... Um, the comfort crisis that we, the comfort crisis and essentialism, other books of that we love. Um, yeah, just I love all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, no, no, not the greatest students, Sim. Me and you would have got along. We all would have got along with us, right? If you taught me though, <laughs> we would have been able to like talk about footy. That's it. Talk about the footy on the weekend. Maybe have a casual bet <laughs> on the track or something. Talking about that, you love learning stuff. You are a podca- podcast host yourself, Runners Radio. And you just interviewed Paul Ruse recently, which is um, like a huge guest, Rick. Like, what's and I suppose some of your other episodes have been people that you've said have been like mentors or people you've looked up to, and you've been able to like speak to them one on one. Like, tell us about that. How did that all? Well, work I, I, I love the podcast platform, and I really have been on it. I think just because I just spoke about how I don't really struggle to read um, if it's not in my field, and podcasts are great for that. Or you can just capture anything like you want to learn it these days it's just so easy to learn it's so cool um about 2013 14 i was really smashing podcasts as a consumer and then about 2018 i started runners radio um with tom senior who's an educator at john paul actually he's a legend he's he's a runners member tommy and he i think he's a year 12 coordinator something john paul he's a legend he um another teacher maybe a guest for you um he's just a producer he just does all that stuff that you guys have got set up there on your computers which is awesome uh, i just wanted to interview a bit of everything, everyday humans. We did mental health segments. We've done that stuff, which is really powerful. The last eighteen months, just because of COVID, I think um, since COVID, I just started picking off. Um, I guess yeah, mentors of mine, idols of mine, even if they didn't know it. Um, so the Craig Mottrams and that were were before, and he was my athletic idol. He was oh, that was a face to face one. But then in COVID, I just started doing yeah, lots of ones. So I went overseas, coaches, physiologists that I really looked up to and you just reach out these days and most people are more than happy to oblige because um, they understand that once they talk like it's going to help someone like this podcast might help one person um, one one landscaping bum that wants to do, do something a bit more with his life and not have 55 schooners every night like he, he might resonate with me there or something do you know what I mean so that kind of stuff might work uh, Tom Swartz another couple of Americans Mario Frioli like Lee Trooper is an Aussie three time marathoner and then, yeah, other guys, but Paul Roos is a big one, isn't it? Like, yeah, we're how, from did you, how did you do, did you just reach I out? I reached to out, mate, yeah, I'm sure. Just emailed or? Uh, 
think that one might have been LinkedIn yeah. email. Um, I reckon that might have been LinkedIn email. So uh, LinkedIn message. Um, he's a champion. Like he's as a, we're all Victorian. So Paul Roos is a household name, and he like he obviously grew up. He grew up. He was one of the top three or four footballers in the country in the eighties and nineties, and then obviously one of the great coaches. So I just wanted to get him more for his coaching and his life balance philosophy and what he does with businesses these days, which is massive in culture and high performance and leadership. Uh, he was named Father of the Year. All these things that are really cool, um, and I really align a lot with his values. So. I wanted to get him on, um, but yeah, I don't know, mate. I think it was a LinkedIn message, and then went from there. But it was pretty cool. It was very similar to this boys. It was a very intimate setting, face to face. Both him and me like to do the interviews face to face. I really prefer them. I reckon they're really it is better. better I, I yeah. love them. Yeah. Yeah, I know you guys do ninety eight, or probably all of them, face to face as well. Uh, obviously, if they're overseas, especially this, it's impossible to do it overseas. But if they're in Victoria, like, why well, wouldn't you? Know, it's just nice, and we're having a coffee here. You know, nice little setting. We've got. Some rat bag bouncing a basketball. <laughs> Still, guys, if you can't, very authentic. It's really teaching me resilience right now. See, every day you get taught something, don't you, Simo? Like, you do. I'm trying to talk, and Crowey's trying to run a great show here, and I've got some kid bouncing a basketball. <laughs> no, it's been, the, the podcast has been great fun. Um, it, I think you guys have been really prolific. It's been really good, but our podcast, look, it's gone for three and a half years, and I reckon we've had 50 shows, um, really good content, but. It always, because we're always filming anyway for runners and always recording and you're always on a deadline and timelines, I think the podcast probably gets pushed back a bit. I guess if I had someone seeking guests for me, I reckon it would just flow because then I can just rock in and, yeah. do, and do the research, do the planning. Um, like you guys plan so well for this stuff and I, I do enjoy the prep work and just learning about them. Like I feel like I could write a book about Rusey. Mm. Um, he didn't have any, like you guys made me answer awesome questions and that I, I didn't give Ruzi anything I just did it myself because I, I like to have it in my brain and then I just go and talk very similar to like a runner session or anything like if you prepare well uh, teachers no doubt you guys have to prepare it, it more than anyone like, you prepare well and the way I've always worked as long as I'm prepared for whatever I've got to do I can go and just uh, add a little bit, little bit because I kind of got a shape in my head that I want it to flow like um, and I like that ad lib nature of coaching because it is half art half science and I feel with coaching that I do know the science very well, so I can have that art factor where I can speak to Crowe on a different level that I'd speak to an 80-year-old lady. I can speak to Crowe about what he did on the weekend or whatever, and I can speak to the, the lady about, yeah, other stuff. So I think it's a good mix, don't you reckon, Red Cow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like we're, we're both teachers. We both had a crack at presenting Josh and I, and like the preparation that we do often there's a lot of you run it through your head over and over again and we've laughed before about it. sometimes you run it through your head and I know personally especially a few times I've gotten to doing like a session like a, a talk or whatever and I'm that I've done it that many times in my head I don't want to do it like I'm just dreading it I just want it to be over and it takes the enjoyment out of it but like your runner sessions like you just touched on them they get the online so 45 minutes there's no stop start cutting or anything like that is it? it's just Straight down the barrel, down. yeah. Like, yeah. How, how have you been able to grow into being able to do that? Because you're basically presenting for 45 minutes. Yeah, right? honestly, mate. Like, it's you, you got to remember. Like, I did. I've done it every single day since 2007, since the start. And like for a fair chunk of those time, like pretty much before co until COVID in March 23, 2020, I was doing it six times a day. Obviously, <laughs> to 25 people at a time, not to a barrel. But the barrel. He's just another person because I'm, I'm really trying to help a lot more people with, with the app and, and the, that stuff and the website. So um, the, I've always got two people behind me, which I think does help um, having those two people behind me. So we're Crowe and Simo are running behind me um, on, on treadmills, obviously, because we're in a studio and, I, and I'm talking to the barrel. Um, it just flows, mate. When you've done something for that long and you like, I'm not an expert in many things, but I feel like I could talk, I could talk for hours about the stuff I talk about on there. And then you, so you, you always have a shape, yeah. So the shape is, uh, you set the person up. So the first ten minutes of their sessions, there's obviously an interval, so they're recovering and, and doing efforts. But they might feel like absolute rubbish, and likely they might, they will. So they just set them up. If they've got to walk, just set the session up. Talk a little bit of physiology, tiny bit, just so they know what's happening. Mostly talk about the two people behind me, so engaging. They're your teammates, Simo and Crowley. Mostly talk about how good you two are, uh, which I'll get to later on this show, of course. Uh, and then the last 15 minutes, what we speak about mostly is that guts and determination and that motivation. Because you're already 25 or whatever, 30 minutes through the session. So whether it's a good or a bad session, just get it done. 
get it done, work on efficiency, but get it done. And this is what we talk about, not getting too high or too low on certain sessions. Like, don't carry on like a, um, yeah, like Craig Mottram, if you've had a good session, be proud of yourself, bloody oath, give me, but just know that it's another rung in the ladder, but certainly don't get too down on yourself if you had a bad session, because that's what people do, and then they fall off the wagon. It's about banking those sessions, but I know I've gone really off tangent there. Um, <laughs> I speak to the barrel, I'm just, I don't know, mate, it's like anything, prepare. If you prepare, and I do prepare, I do, like people think I'm, I'm a bit of a, um, I guess, whatever, but I do prepare well, really well, uh, but then I do ad-lib a lot. So I don't need notes or anything, no. It's probably a fine line there, isn't it? You, you want to prepare so you're confident with what you're doing, but if you're over-preparing, you go into that presentation or whatever. You certainly don't... Yeah, Crowe yeah. mentioned before about wishing the time, like wishing <laughs> it was gone. That was only when early days of presenting it for you. But yeah, I think if you're wishing it away or like anything, like it's not going to be as good as it could be. You still be pretty bloody good. I'm sure there's lots of people that get really nervous um, about presenting and no one would know, and it looks amazing. Yeah. But I reckon that extra 2 or 3% uh, as a teacher or a coach or a performer on whatever TV, whatever, if you if you you want it, you just want to embrace the moment, embrace the the time because um yeah, if you're nervous or wishing it would just finish, I don't. You're probably not doing yourself. You're doing yourself a disservice, in, even if it's in a small small way. Yeah, and you touched on this before, like in terms of like for teachers out there or coaches, anyone listening, in, in regards to wanting to reach out to their mentors and stuff. It's so easy these days, isn't it? Jump on LinkedIn, jump on Twitter. And I think people, as you said, people are so willing to give up their time or just send an email back to give you some advice if you've got a question for them, which you know, we've done quite a bit with the podcast just to get people on. But everyone's so willing to reach out and help you, which is awesome. Mm. Um, but in doing that, what's been the motivation for your podcast? Has it been you talked about you love learning now? Is it for learning? Is it for helping others? Yeah, definitely helping others with mine. Because um, I love... I love being consuming the content, okay, so from all over the world. Um, and I love, I kind of know where I want to go with the guests, so whether it's a Paul Ruse or uh, someone from overseas or whatever it may be, I kind of know if I'm walking or jogging along on an easy jog or I'm driving to work or whatever, um, I know what I'd want to get out of interviewing Simo, for example. Yeah. So yeah, definitely definitely to help others, like, like, the run, like the whole thing is really. Um, it's, it's really cool that I'm in a position to do that because that interview I did with Ruzi, two hours of my life, but it's, it could help people in six years. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, it's, it's about helping others. It's, it's really nice to meet them. Obviously, it's nice to meet some of your idols, isn't it? It always is, um, especially if you, you're collaborating. But no, it's certainly to help others, mate. Because like, I, I feel like I've got so much out of it over the last decade, audio content. Um, and like you said, we live in a bloody good age. Like, yeah. The percentages of being born right now in this age are crazy, especially lucky enough to be born in a country like Australia, let alone to be able to just click on a bloody purple button and, and listen to This Is Your Teaching Life, which is, <laughs> let, let's be let's be honest, it's top shelf. Thanks, mate. We appreciate that one. <laughs> I've given you a five-star review. Make sure everyone out there gives them a five-star review because it really does help get Simo and Crowey in the earbuds of everybody else. So five-star review before you, listen, you leave this show, please. Yeah, mate, you've been a coach for a long time. I imagine you've faced some tri- trials and tribulations along the way. Like, what are, what are some of the toughest challenges you've, you've been faced with as a coach? And how, yeah. How have you overcome those? Yeah, so that's a good question, Steve. Jeez, you're pulling out the well, big I guns. I suppose one that could have been a challenge, perceived challenge COVID. that we spoke about, yeah, it was COVID. Yeah. You were already sort of on the ball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not, uh, not knowing COVID was coming, but you were kind of going to make a shift. Yeah. Good question. That's a good question. So obviously there's always, I think of teachers and coaches, there's the tendency to be burnt out um, often. Um, I don't know how you boys handle it these days. I'm not sure, but um, I, I was probably burnt out from 2014, I guess. So for si- a good six years before COVID, I was declining at a rapid rate physically. Um, and because you're in it and... Um, I love my job, but I was we were always pushing the app side of it. So we're working in the sideline to film that. And at the end of the day, you just want to help more people. But also, want, you want it to be viable. You want to enjoy it, your life with your family as well. Um, but when we had the massive headquarters, like, yeah, 4 a.m. starts was a big challenge. So Talk, for the people that don't know, you had sessions running from 4 to... 4.30 a.m. Uh, yeah, till 4.30 till about uh, 11 a.m. and then back in the evening. We did have two or three really good, three really good, four really good coaches. They were awesome. They helped us out at night, but I did all the mornings. 4.30 a.m., yep, starts. That's fine if you're on the tools or whatever, but I had to be on 
from 4.30, like not just, and I guess 15 years of doing it, I was done. So I had to be on in front of these 20, 25 people, back to back to back to back. And it's not the per people's fault at 9.30 that you've already seen 150 people, so you've got to be on for them as well. And it's 98% of people are amazing human beings as well, and they're still on the runners app today. So it's not the people, it's just more the energy you had to exude. Yeah. So, and yeah, you hold yourself to a pretty high account, so you don't want to, you don't want to um, be off for someone or some some group was that was definitely a challenge sorry mate i interrupted i was just going to say because one of your strengths too which i imagine would take a lot of mental energy is that you know one thing about every single person that walks through your door like i've seen you in action just you know talking to other people you go oh how's this going like to know that something about that many people must have taken a fair bit of energy too uh yeah thanks it's it's not yeah i guess it just naturally just got a bit too much but yeah. And I, yeah, I'm not sure how I would have got, but you had to. Uh, we we're in that position that we always had to. Like we punch. If I didn't rock up, you can't pay the mortgage, you can't pay the bills, and you know, so it was just that kind of trap. So, 100, percent I think people would understand in many businesses too. As soon as COVID kind of hit, um, perceived, perceived um, really bad experience, and look, still emotional because you got all this stuff. And we had to pivot massively. We already had this app out. We had it out probably eight weeks before, which was great timing obviously because everyone was forced online and then uh, but still uh, you're selling off so much that you've worked so hard for and all that kind of stuff but uh, we, we pretty much knew two or three weeks in mate that it was um it was going to be very very good for us because you can put the time all that time that you used to, you used to be in this building with um you can still help all those same people like i still check in via text and email you can still help all those same people they've got me in their ears wherever they anytime anywhere so most people really love it more because um, of their own flexibility, but then you can help so many other people. You can put your time and energy into actually building that product, as opposed to put your time and energy into just that one postcode. So it's it's been a really really good thing. But I think all coaches and teachers go through those moments. Like you guys, I don't know how many times you must burn out a year, or if you've got mechanisms in place that you don't do that anymore. But I can imagine your first seven or eight years you would have burnt out plenty because you just care so much. You just care <coughs> care so much. Um, about your kids and about the people you the teachers you're leading. Uh, you're not just doing it for a paycheck, are you? So no, that that's that's the major challenge. Yeah. Definitely. And what about like going back to how it all began, where'd the confidence come from to think like obviously you've had an awesome idea, like where'd the confidence come from to be like, Yep, yeah, I'm doing it, buy the bullet, give up the landscaping tools <laughs> and into run it, so how it come about? Good question, Simo. Um I think the facts I just knew, mate. I there was now whenever so I was doing a fair bit of study, I was studying um, I think when I was studying, I, yeah, I was still living at home, which definitely helped, obviously. But it wasn't long after I started runners that I moved out. So I obviously, it was obviously quite quick. But I just think, mate, I, I had, I had, I didn't have to worry about finance too much because I lived at mum and dad's joint. So that was probably the major thing. Like, I don't know if, if and I knew that I was always, I reckon even when Crowley knew me, like in my 28, 19, 20, when I was just landscaping and, and partying and obviously playing footy on a Saturday, um, I always had this desire to do this kind of stuff. I didn't know I was going to be endurance coaching. No, yeah. I didn't know I was going to be running. But I always wanted to be some for, like coaching of some kind. Um, but yeah, you need to just pull the trigger. So if anyone's listening out there that might be in their forties and has done the same thing for twenty five years, it's miserable. Like it's it's there's no greater time than now. I would say really educate yourself before and just have a drive. Write something up on your wall, whatever it's got to be. Know your why. We talk about that very often, don't we? Knowing your why. And not, not why, like we're lucky to be here. Why put it off another day? Um, I understand you've got to get finances and that kind of stuff in order. But really, um, possessions mean nothing, do they? So you just, just continue to, to go toward what makes you happy. So, And we are in a similar field, us three. And we, we all, um, I think there's a lot of, what's the word? There's a lot of gratification from helping other people. Yeah. Um, satisfaction from seeing people improve young kids improve so yeah pull the trigger now guys don't uh, don't wait there's n- there's no time like the present is there Crowley? <laughs> that's not yeah, with that like you're obviously coaching and training a lot of people can you think of like a few moments where you've like thought you've just felt so proud for someone achieving like their goals like I know recently there was the um, Great Ocean Road uh, marathon that was on that we had a big crew that went out there like is that the sort of stuff that keeps you going? Or yeah, is it's pretty a cool. Story, like a particular story that you can share? That oh yeah, there's lots. There's lots of amazing stories. I love. Look, people are really nice normally with with texts and emails. Just off off the cuff, with um, with they're showing their gratitude. Some some of the people I don't even know. 
face to face yet. Um, but that's really nice, and it does take. So every now and then, you get a few words that really take you aback and and make you like obviously a little bit emotional and go, "Gee, this is." It's far more powerful than just trying to trying to pay the bills. Um, definitely that um, the text or email replies. But yeah, you see people. You spoke to Great Ocean Road just a few weeks back. Uh, the big events where people you know their journey intimately. Um, uh, me, Perth talking about me as a coach, and you just know it must be similar for you guys with the kids, but you just know how far they've come, um, and they've just they've just come so far. If they finish a marathon, um, let's just use the marathon. Um, let's just use that. Okay, so when they finish a marathon, and they've got us around them, so runners, family, they've got their own, maybe a young kid or whatever runs out on the course with them, and you know that there's no chance nine months ago they could have ran a quarter of that distance. That's probably the major ones, mate. And also, when people make lifestyle changes that are going to last them for the next 40 years. Because usually when you run a marathon or a half marathon, um, you don't normally... You're going to go up and down, because fitness isn't linear, and life isn't linear, but you don't normally go back to really sedentary habits. So normally when you run a marathon or a half marathon, it normally changes your life from, from a massively positive perspective. And they can normally carry that routine through the next 40 years. So those young kids that finish the race with them and they've got great picks and great memories, um, when those kids have got grandkids and, and you're 85, then you can still get up and down with them and, and move around the backyard and play cricket with them and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered that question. but I, I, think, I think the finishing line of a marathon is pretty... It's a generic answer, but it's pretty bloody special. And seeing how it changes people's lives. Mm. Yeah, much like you guys. It would be very similar. <laughs> Stop trying to deflect it back to yeah. This is about you. <laughs> well, it's, this next question for you, mate. I don't. I feel like you might not like this one. You oh, work, Sam, what are you going you with? Might, you work with a lot of people. Yes, mate. In your runners' organisation, how would they describe you? Wow. Yeah. Good question. That one, isn't it? I'm on the spot here. Um, no, I think. Um, oh, I think authentic and empathetic would be would be two. Oh, I definitely. I've never pretended to be something I'm not. So I think. The person that me and Crowley or Crowley might have had 20 beers with, and we still could have 20 beers of Sava. But I think knowledgeable and empathetic and authentic, I, I'd definitely, I'd back myself into, um, and you, you say, look, I don't like talking about myself, and I don't, but as an athlete, no, but as a coach, I'd back myself in to be one of the very best in the world. Yeah. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I don't think, from a preparation perspective, and from a caring and authenticity perspective, yeah, I, there's because I know I, don't, I know a lot of coaches as well, and I know I'm in it for the right reasons. I think people will see that definitely. Um, so that would be the major one, mate. So I've gone from Crow saying I'm modest to me calling myself one of the best in the world. But, um, it's <laughs> it, it, it's a great yeah. quick turn. See what, see what happens when you talk about yourself for 45 minutes. <laughs> no, nah, honestly, boys, that, that's that's the truth. I think empathy. Yeah. empathy Authentic and doing everything for the right reasons was definitely the answer there, mate. Yeah, it said authentic a few times. I noticed I was listening to the Paul Roos um, episode, which if people haven't listened to, definitely check it out. But he also talked about the importance of people being authentic. Do you want to touch on that for us? Yeah, well, people see through it, don't they? Similar, yeah. like, there's no point. Like, it's life's, life's so, we're lucky to be, like I said before, like, why would you want to be anyone but yourself? Um, there's too many people out there now with social networks trying to be someone they're not, they're, or trying to impress someone. So, oh, I'm, Mate, I'm just who I am. Well, I'm a um, yeah, I am. I, I do like to have a good time, um, but I do like to continue to improve. Whether it's like from a coaching, athletics, as a human perspective, like get becoming better at different stuff, and I'll definitely tell you my weaknesses as well. So um, I never wanted to be anything I was not because it's not sustainable for one, um, and I think. As an athlete or a te- uh, student, sorry, and you're looking up to your teacher or coach, if that coach or that leader or that CEO isn't authentic, um, it won't take long for him yeah. to be found out. And I don't think it augurs uh, for success from your, your your people following you. So whether in my case it's runners trying to run 5K to the marathon or whether it's your students or whether you're a CEO and you're trying to really um, push for success within the company, I don't think... Like that, they'll see right through you if if you're not genuine. Um, so I couldn't possibly go and um, what's and start a plumbing business and be authentic with yeah. my with my apprentices because 
I don't know anything about it. Um, I'd still try to be a good bloke and be a good human, but how can I be authentic with them if I don't even know it a glue or pipe? So um, I'd like to think I, I, I know the industry back to front and I just want people to do things the right way so they get better and improve. But yeah, I, I think that would be the answer. Always put yourself in the, in the athlete, the student, the employee's shoes. Uh, how would they... Um, how would they react if I wasn't authentic, or if they could see for a minute? Yeah, how would I be? I was like, this is this guy's a flog. Yeah. Like he, he doesn't. I reckon he might know a little bit, but even then, I reckon he's trying to talk talk rubbish. So, and then again, then continuity falls away. Success, there's no chance. Um, buy in, you don't get the athlete or the student buy in. All those things. So, and I always try to create the good culture, which no doubt you do. And Rusey spoke to this. He goes, um, always go and ask the youngest or the newest member in the in the yeah, group that was, that was cool wasn't it yeah yeah that really made me think about our setting and teaching like because we've both been there for a while now like yeah. i wonder what new people coming in would say yeah yeah it was a great point so yeah, you, you can say the point like he said the the newest teacher in the, in the staff room or the newest member in the group or the newest member in the office go and go to them the person that's been there the least amount of time two weeks three weeks go to them and ask them what the culture is like at Pearsdale primary or or runners or whatever, um, and they'll they'll tell you because that they'll, they'll know they'll pick up on those things. Whereas, um, so it's pretty cool. I like that quote as well because yeah, I reckon if you're always being yourself and you're always preaching what you believe, then the culture is always going to be good. It's only when you try to deviate from being yourself or you try to be something you're not or you try to create, try to force something that's just not you or not your company or, or brand. That's when the culture turns to rubbish. I reckon. Yeah. Um, and you, if you let your standards slip, which often happens if you're trying to be something you're not. So, yeah. Now, talking about authenticity, Rick, we haven't really touched on your running journey, I suppose, as well, because you were actually quite a good runner yourself. <laughs> Have you, what, like, you know, marathons or your you know, most enjoyable race that you've done? Yeah. We can keep it G-rated if you want to, because <laughs> I know you've done a few runs up. You talked before. <laughs> you talk, we'll go to it now. You did talk before about how you used to party in your younger days yes lots of and I believe you know like Josh and I have a few beers on a Saturday <laughs> night and probably sit on the couch and battle a bit but you there's a bit of a legend that Rick used to get up and go for these massive runs after a big night on a Saturday night so yeah unfortunately any truth to those runs? Lots of, that's a truth unfortunately um You'd be surprised often that still happens uh, <laughs> on, on the runners' long runs. I'm got better. So I'm on a structure now. I've got this 16 week marathon plan we're, we're doing. So I was told myself I'm not going to be do any of those long runs hung over. Yeah, lots, mate. Yeah. Look, again, bad habits. And I'm not perfect by any stretch. It was funny. I was interviewing Ruse, Paul Ruse, and a couple of my absolute idols in life. Um, Brett Kirk, who's just this Buddhist monk. I'll get to the run in a minute. I mean, this Buddhist monk, hard worker. Brett Kirk used to absolutely. Um, Flog himself on beep tests and the like. Just a legend leader. And I also did as a young bloke, obviously before the other issues, Ben Cousins as well. So those two personalities are very, very different as we know. Mm. But I always love both of them. And I guess a little bit of my life is both. I always love Kirky, but also love the way Cousins used to smash himself on the footy field as well. Um, and I guess I, I did struggle. And this is it's probably, we've all got our stuff. I did struggle to rein it in at certain times with the party and and, um, and that kind of stuff. And I did run hungover lots, lots Lots of times. But you were running like long distance as well. And yeah. Quick time and I certainly don't advocate this for the listeners or, the, or if they've got kids out there. Look, it's not, I'm not proud of it, but it, yeah, that does happen still. But I'm really structured now in my weeks where I'll I'll tick every box. Yeah, I did. I ran a lot of very long runs, like yeah. 25 to 30 kilometers. But regardless of being hungover, do you think that was just a part of your personality? It was my you personality. Feel like you were good at suffering when you were running. I could suffer. You could just yeah, I can. Push through that. Yeah, thing. and I think that's, so yeah, my, some of my best races in a normal perspective, yeah, uh, I guess 5K, 10K, just being really breathless for that whole period and just, yeah, and just being able to, I guess, settle in it. So you set, and this goes for any, settle in the discomfort, 12 and a half laps on the track or 25 laps on the track. The marathon is a little bit different because you're not as breathless, especially for the first 30K. But yeah, just being able to settle in on that, um, in that lactic discomfort. And the less you panic, the better. So if you're out there, you're thinking, oh, just don't panic. Like you're gonna, you're gonna be uncomfortable. It's a thing. Um, you know, you're gonna be really uncomfortable, and every orifice in your body is gonna want to stop. But you just gotta resist the temptation to stop. Which is, which is, once you do it a few times, like anything, crowy, like you do get better at doing it. So that's what I'm saying. If you do this, if you're practicing training, getting uncomfortable twice a week, 
regardless of the physiology that's improving, psychologically, you know that you've been there before, you've been there before, you've been there before. So yeah, yeah, I, I had a few nice marathon results and um, I certainly had a few nice results that I was happy with. And I look, as a 38-year-old, now that I've got my life back, I'm trying to build back up to that um, and really, I feel like I'm nowhere near... I still want to run PBs in all those four distances from 5K to the middle, absolutely. The good thing about running is you do, you can peak in your 40s. I've got people that peak in their 50s. So, yeah, running's, running was really good for me, I think, from a mental health perspective. And we talk often about the mental health uh, benefits, um, and I won't bore you too much with that stuff, but the neurotransmitters that are released after after you move in the morning, like even a brisk walk, uh, dopamine, endorphins is pretty famous, serotonin, norepinephrine. Uh, there's four massive hormones and neurotransmitters that are released and we we talk often about those but um i think for me if i didn't have running if i didn't have footy and running oh jesus but yeah and it's not it's definitely not funny i probably would have gone down a real bad path um and i we, we don't often talk about it. i think i was speaking a bit about it on a mental health show we did two or three years ago but yeah everyone's got their stuff haven't they and that was definitely i really struggled to rein in yeah going out a lot uh, and it, it's it's not normal is it for a a coach or a, 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 yeah it's not normal but oh, oh, that's I haven't really shied away from that so I think people would enjoy the honesty on that um, yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty incredible for where you like oh, it's a good lesson in just finding balance I suppose yeah, in life, it? Like, yeah it is yeah life balancing yeah it's, it's not not easy to find and we're all in our are you in your 30s isn't it? just yeah <laughs> just. Jeez, you're a young pup I'm 38 and it's look, I'm, I'm a million times better and I'm so much happier within myself now than I probably was five years ago, let it ten years ago. Um, and Shelley, my wife, is um, been massive to that, and three young kids and all that. So all that stuff's great. But Shell's helped me a lot. I do a lot of other stuff that I really like. I, I like like people like um, Joe Dispenza, who, who's a who's a person from the states. I've really follow him and do a lot of that kind of stuff. And just I'm really fascinated by the neuroplasticity of the brain and and just changing old habits uh, like. Joe Dispenza talks to what you've done, but pretty much who you are 35 is just a whole memory of the past and you can really change that, um, but you've got to be conscious of it. Otherwise, like, you're pretty much, you're hardwired to be like forever if you don't intervene with some stuff. So yeah, I could have gone down many different paths, Crow, but yeah, it's it's, it's interesting stories and I know people, um, it's interesting listening, hearing some some dickhead run 30K after, <laughs> after 30 beers, but... Um, <laughs> It's, oh, I'm not proud of it, but unfortunately, it, it probably even in post in COVID times, mate, I would have done it truckloads. And you know, you might talk about it when you get 10k in to the run, and you go, oh, geez, <laughs> shouldn't have, I should have got to bed earlier. Those. But the, again, I'm a big one for structure, and these 16 week plan, when week two, week three, I think it's been golden for me. So I haven't done it this preparation, buddy. So is this towards the Melbourne Marathon? Yeah, Melbourne. My, my first one in 10 years. I haven't ran a marathon in 10 years just because of runners, really, just because yeah. of the business. I just couldn't. So we've got truckloads going towards Melbourne Marathon, half and 10, um, and that's really cool. I'm really looking forward to that, and I love routine. Um, I, know, I, I know I love being ad-lib and love being uh, spontaneous, but routine, if you've got that same lot of planning, Simo, you've got that planning. If I've done my two hard runner sessions and long run, then everything else is a bonus, you know, it just kind of flows, so... Yeah. Love to explore that because, I mean, as I said before, I'd never run 10K before. Got on Strava and I'm shocking that if I'm going, if I, I was training myself to try and just do a half marathon, but I would go out every time and try and run as far as I could, as quick as I could. No structure in place. What's the importance for people out there if they want to get up and yeah. run as far as they can, the importance of like mixing up their training load? I think with most endurance sports, running in particular because it is impact. Um, and impact cops are really bad rap, but yeah, it's it's not as bad. It's not bad for you. Look, there's so much studies out there that running is actually good for your knees. So I won't get into that, but definitely to be as basic and simplistic as possible, if you want to run a half marathon in the next 16 weeks, the basic shape of it, it just must involve two runs a week where you're at least one, but hopefully two where you are above that said pace. So if you want to run a half marathon in, let's just use 206, I think is six minute case. You've got to be um, doing these interval sessions whether it's a runner session or a fart leg or whatever it may be, at a bit quicker than that. So VO2 type pace, which just means your body's got to really get be stressed and the capacity is stressed to use oxygen to work your muscles. So it's really, it's a hard session, yeah? yeah? Anywhere from 25 to 45 minutes, twice a week. But you need regeneration days in there. So easy jogging, brisk walking, cycling, swimming, Pilates yoga, 
meditation, stretching, mobility. You can't do any more than those two sessions. So, And then a, a longer run where you gradually pick it up for three weeks, then maybe drop it down. This is very simplistic, guys. And you gradually pick it up, then drop it down for an easier deload. Pick it up, drop it down again for an easier deload. So that's for 16 weeks. You might do your longest run three weeks out, 21 days out. And that could be anywhere from 17K for a half marathon to 18K to 30K, 32K. Depends on the level of athlete. And they're running 21.1 on race day. But what Simo was talking about then is what often people do is they get they go, they rock out their door because running so simple. You just put your runners on and you just run the same pace for the same distance 25 days in a row or, or 19 days out of 25. I'm going to run this 8K loop around my block and I'm going to try to beat my time because you know what's going to happen. The first five weeks you actually do improve really quickly. And you go, how good's this? And then because you're not doing the interval stuff and you're not recovering, okay, so the interval stuff you do, well, say Tuesday, Friday, you do a hard interval session, you've stressed your heart with all the stuff with skeletal muscle, tendons, stuff we spoke about earlier. You need to regenerate, sleep well, eat well, do some really easy walking or jogging on the days, then go back to the well Friday. That's when you get better. You actually get better in the regeneration and the recovery phase when you're sleeping and when you're recovering. So if Simo's going to run 8K time trials every night, he's not recovering at all. In fact, he's putting himself further in the hole, further in the hole. So his performance not only plateaus, possibly drops off. His motivation, well, that goes to the shitter. And he just runs like a busted for the next five weeks. And then he goes, a run is not for me. And unfortunately, that's what often what people do. Um, so, and Strava's the same, because you run this loop. Well, I ran that loop in 31 minutes. Well, surely it's just the natural progression that I get to 26. Uh, that doesn't happen. So back to the elite guys, Simo. Say Stuart McSwain or Mottram runs 12 runs a week. Remember, he's a professional and he doesn't have to work. 12 runs a week. Only two of them will be even pushing the clock. Yeah. The other ten's just easy jogging. So I can't implore you listeners enough. Um, if you're thinking about running, one or two really hard sessions. The rest are easy or walking, and then on the weekend you can push it out a bit longer. So three runs that actually matter, in essence. But yes, I'd say what you did was a common mistake, brother. But you're going to run the half marathon in Melbourne. <laughs> Post the sign us up. Post the, bur- post the bird for your beautiful upcoming baby, of course, and then you could just get a nice photo of Bubs at the half marathon, yeah. finish with a lap of the MCG. <laughs> Listeners, Crowy and Simo will be running the half marathon in Melbourne. When is it? Uh, 14 and a half weeks away. They will keep you updated on their journey on the show. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, po- race, we'll, yeah. po- we'll post a good pic of the three of us, eh? At the end. That'll be marvellous. Let's do that. Locked in. I have the bib. <laughs> I've registered you. Was, the half marathon, not the full one. Yeah, half, half's full. Yeah. Well, I've had. We do go along and be my third time lucky because I've done the same as you. Just yeah. you haven't haven't done the structure properly. Yeah. Just you know, I suppose you know all the, what those things you touched on before. It's basically stuff that you know, but just keeping it in that structure, I find is the tricky part because you know you can just go out. And yeah, run. Run. Not even. Yeah. But structure is good because what it does, apart from the fact that you know you're getting better, that's why I do like to talk a lot about the science so it educates people to actually do it. Because a lot of people, especially type A people, people that you guys are so busy. He's going to want to do it. And even if you know, it might not be right. Whereas if you know what you're doing is going to help you, I think they, they're more tend to do it. Like, what, if Crowley feels good, why would he want to hold back? Well, he just smashed himself yesterday. So he actually needs his body to catch up and feel better in, internally. And then he's actually going to get better in six months. Um, and it makes people take the pressure off. They, they go for easy jogs. They'll go for conversational paces. Um, and we've all got those people that just run too fast on their easy days and so on. Well, I just did a hard session yesterday. I'm just going to jog. I want to be able to jog and talk on this run. Do you know what I mean? And if it's good enough for the Olympians and the elites, like, that's why I keep trying to advocate for, for general pop that are busier and, and should be running easier. So, yeah, and I think you guys are both smart dudes. Once you know why you're doing it, I think you'll always do it. And you, Crowley just broke because of footy and other stuff, really. But you try to do a couple of marathons in, um, but you, you'll get your debut yeah. in. I think I've learned through the experience of trying to start it that, yeah, Less is more and sticking to the not having It's not sexy, numbers. is it? It's not sexy and it's not like the bells and whistles of like a, a footy game or anything. It's just the, the, the reward is is, every, is so, so, so powerful. What the, and what, just the way you feel day to day once you have a routine. Like even me, like I spoke of how bad like my habits have been over the years, but the routine of just feeling good after training hard in the morning or training easy or doing mobility or, or doing that stuff, it's really, really cool. Unreal, Rick. Well, we're sort of getting towards the end of the podcast, mate, and this is where you get to leave, not that you haven't already, but a bit of a legacy or some hacks and tips for some of our listeners. 
one, you know, having you in a, you're a small business owner, like what, what, what's it like to run a small business and what would you say to people wanting to emulate, emulate you or just start their own business? You sort of said before, like just have a crack, but is there any sort of tips along the way that... Yeah, I, I, I think, I think the preparation is quite important, but you, you got to remember to have, to enjoy it as well. I think if you're starting a business, um, you only in the to only make money um, I think it's going to be really hard and it's going to take over your life a little bit I think you've got to enjoy like oh, I'm very lucky that I enjoy what I do and I enjoy I love every single day I love what I do so that's that's that very and even at those times we spoke to the 4am starts and the yelling for 15 years like I still love the people and I love seeing people improve so you've got to love what you do you just have to um, if you're even if it's a new idea that might seem mundane but you go oh this could really make money it's great like you want it to be viable but you've got to love what you're doing um so that goes for any small business um i think surround yourself with good people is a big one um like shell has obviously been in the business with me for the whole time but we've also got a lot of other good people around us um just supportive and that kind of stuff so surround yourself with really good people love what you do um no it's not going to be linear no it's going to be ups and downs but don't get too high or too low like, like I said about running before like don't you're going to have bad days like it's it, just life isn't it but don't get too high and I really believe this because I, I let it go a bit I was I was an, a running coach and and I, I was really let my own health go really down down the gurgler uh, for four or five years so um, another good saying Steve which you can put on the, the show notes which is about your as a business owner your own health will, des- will determine the health of your business there is nothing sure than that. So I, I, I guess we already had a really good nucleus. I was really, but um, now that I'm healthier and fitter, um, I'm definitely feeling the energy for the business again. Mm. Um, so your own health will determine the health of your business. Goes for the classroom, oh, goes for the I was just thinking yeah. about that exactly as you said that. It's, yeah, so true of a classroom. If yeah. you run down and that, your grade's going to be definitely restless. Reflective, bit, isn't it? Yeah. And again, people might not always know, but you know you could be better. And imagine the 25, 30 kids could be better. Uh, and goes for me. So, you, yeah, I'll leave you. That, that's a good nugget, I reckon, for any business owner. It's so tempting to go all in and forget about everything else. So you need the balance. We spoke about life balance. You need to go down to the local sport. You need to make sure you make you get the kids' sports in and all that kind of stuff. That's really important. Don't don't ever. And I never I never neglected that. But I definitely the one thing I did neglect was my own, my own health by some margin. But, you know, that, that's, that's a good tip. Um, and it's always going to be worthwhile. Like small business is a beautiful thing. Um, it's always going to be worthwhile. I think in the long run. I think you'll. I think if you're thinking about doing it, prepare. Make sure you're going to love it. Think about what every day is going to look like, and look after yourself. That's number one. Yeah. Oh, some great tips in there, mate. Uh, now I said I've recently got into running and love love nothing more now than going for a run, and listen to a podcast. Uh, is there any podcast you would recommend listeners that enjoy the same thing or I should check out while I'm running? Other than Runners Radio. Yeah, oh, Runners well, Radio. Well, Runners Radio, that's R-U-N-N-E-Z, of course. <laughs> right there. You guys will put the show notes in, of course, runners.com, Runners Red Zone. Um, now, look, I, I love, I'm a bit of a nerd with my running stuff, but I like um, all the basic running physiology ones, science of running stuff, but Sweat Elite, if, if for runners, Sweat Elite podcast has got some really good guests on physiology podcast secrets uh, physiology secrets podcast science of ultra but for non-runners this is your teaching life which has come up on my screen is a belter <laughs> that's obviously what you're listening to now but the huberman lab now huberman's a bloke from the states he's really cool huberman lad h-u-b he, he explores all things physiology it's really crazy stuff like not just anything anything to do with health and what it's just cool really cool and it's very different uh the huberman lab um, look, I'm, I haven't got into this yet, but someone recommended Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Uh, okay. Might have been crowy. Uh The Growth Equation with Brad Stuhlberg and Steve Magnus. The Growth Equation is really cool. Uh, these guys talk. Uh, we're in the very similar realm, I reckon. They're from the States as well. Brad Stuhlberg is really good, and Steve Magnus is a really good uh, scientist from the coach. I've got a lot of ESPN stuff on here, boys, but audio books are the ones, boys. That's what I'm, well, me and Crowy wax lyrical about the audio books. Yeah, you know, just before you touch on the books, one thing that made me think about you, I bumped into, I told Simone about this. I went to an old books, uh, 
where I live in Baxter, there's this bookshop that sells books for five bucks. And I walked in there many, many times and I looked at the book uh, Shoe Dog by Phil oh, Knight, awesome. walked past it heaps, and then I finally grabbed it and I just remember reading it. Oh, it was an amazing read, but it talked about, about mm. Prefontaine, Prefontaine, you talk about often in, yeah. uh, in the sessions. That's a great sessions. book. One of, one of the greats. But uh, yeah, books. What yeah, I love books. books. And I love Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog's a great book. For anyone in, we spoke about business. Bloody hell. Phil, yeah. no. Phil Knight, who's the founder of Nike, uh, or Nike, it's, it's amazing, uh, Shoe Dog. It's really cool. Talk about putting your balls in the line, continue. <laughs> <laughs> he just puts his balls in the line every, <laughs> for 15, 20, 30 years. The Comfort Crisis, I just finished. Great book for teachers, I reckon, by Michael uh, Esther. It's a really good book. Just You can imagine it. It just talks to um, how comfortable we are in modern society and, and with uh, smartphones and the like. You can imagine, but it's really cool. Oh, really cool great mix of storytelling and science uh, I love um, I love well, essentialism me and Crowey speak about it you probably talked about it before Crowey on here I love Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty I love that one I've got a lot of running books in here guys uh, The Brain That Changes Itself Running With The Kenyans they're all good books but um, there's two more I wanted to talk to you Peak Performance by Steve Magnus and Brad Stuhlberg I'm trying to think about non-running like, Peak Performance is a great book those two boys and my last one Oh yeah, I liked in Endure by Alex Hutchison, which is again, it doesn't you don't have to be a runner. Endure all these books are really good for high performers in teaching, coaching, leadership fields. But runners radio would be, would be <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, they are good the audio books. I'd never listened to them recently because if I read a book, if I was reading Shoe Dog, I'd probably we could sit here this time next year and listen to it. But the audio books are great, aren't they? Like I've recently yeah. just got onto it. And you Especially just, in a week. Exactly right. I wonder if he rates it feel nice. That would be cool. Yeah, some of them do. I yeah. love when they do. A good question. Uh, you can we'll look at that. It's, well, it won't be good radio if we go and searching for that right now. <laughs> but uh, we could check that off air. Uh, what about you talked about earlier? You love learning. What's the best professional development you've ever done? Oh, that's a good one, Sim. Um, oh, great one. Oh, I think apart from immersing yourself in reading and writing, look, Australian Strength and Conditioning Association is great for that kind of stuff we've um I've done I've done their stuff. Athletics Australia's done some amazing courses. I've gone right up through their realm. Um, where you really get to learn from the best. But I would dare say from from a PD perspective, just spending hours and hours with people like Craig Mottram and, and these kind of guys and Tom Swartz from Colorado who's a PhD in endurance physiology, just just picking their brain. Yeah. So yeah, you can do all the courses and, and Athletics Australia I've been really um, proud to go through their ranks and that but um, to be honest it's more these conversations yeah. um, so Craig Mottram's a 12.55 guy he's, he's the greatest he's possibly the greatest uh, I think I could say white almost the greatest white 5,000 man ever uh, there's another couple coming after his heels but he's just the greatest non-African runner ever almost so picking his brain on end for various various meetings and, and Tom Swartz who's another one of my idols Tin Man from Colorado so those meetings and not just talking about the surface stuff, or going deep yeah. into different methodologies, physiologies, uh, with the whys, um, the, their experiences uh, over Tin Man over 35 years. So I think for anyone out there, the PDs are great, and I, I try to do two or three different courses a year, but you can't beat, when you've got two blokes that have done it all, you can't beat that, can you? Like, like, and I didn't talk to, about Paul Ruse then, because even though he's the best in what he does, like for what I do, those two other blokes, definitely yep. PD. Yep. Um, just quickly too, we've got the Olympics coming up in a couple of weeks. We so have, any, Stephen. Anyone we should be keeping an eye out for? Oh, them? mate, you got another hour? No, <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I love it. I can't wait. Um, look, out the fifteen hundred meter stocks for Australia are absolutely packed. You want to talk about Aussies, obviously? Yeah. yeah Stu McSwain. Who, who are we Stu, Stu McSwain. Yeah. There's a Stu McSwain who's from King Island. He, he's a he's a genuine medal chance. Now we haven't. I got a picture in the other room, boys, of Herb Elliott who won the 1960 Olympic gold um, in the 1500, which is the Blue, Blue Riband event. Uh, that's our last medalist, so 1960. Um, and Stewie McSwain can definitely medal or win it. And there's another young kid who you boys would love. He's got a lot of spunk. He's been to uni, a college in America called Oliver Hall, Ollie Hall. And does he leave it all out there, Crow? He's vomiting on his hands and knees. <laughs> and he's a good-looking fella. He's a bit like you, Crow. He's got a, got a lot of spunk about him. Um, Ollie Hall, so Ollie Hall, Stu McSwain in, in the men's um, and in the women's, same event, 1500, Jessica Hull and Lyndon Hall, very confusing, but those four are super. 
I, I struggle to deviate from those four because the, the 1500 in the men's and women's is just it's absolutely scintillating Stephen it's unbelievable yeah because they're running at like ridiculous paces for a longer than well it's it's four it's minutes. it's three and three quarter laps the 1500 the marathon is always good oh, oh there's a good marathon you boys can watch he's a sparky though Liam Adams lives in Essendon he's a tradie like how good's that so the other two boys we're taking in the marathon Brett Robinson and Jack Rayner are professional um, paid by Nike and they get they're, they're great boys and they, but they get everything looked after for them. Whereas Liam Adams, the third one, he's just he's an electrician. He's just he's such a lad, and he's he's going there to Tokyo as well for the marathon. Um, and the women's marathon is just a good one as well. Um, what's I've gone blank. Sinead Diver, he's like 43, 44, mother of two or three, mother of two, 43 and a half years of age. So you talk about peaking. 43 and a half years of age, Sinead Diver, she won Melbourne Marathon two or three years ago. She's going to the Olympics at that age. The other one's Lisa Waitman, who's also nearly 40. Another mother who's going to her third Olympics. So, and Ali Pashley's on debut. So we've covered the fifth end of the marathon. I won't bore you with any more. <laughs> but, there, but there's um, there's seven or eight Aussies to look out for. Yeah, absolutely. Know? And it's a good time slot for us on this side with the Tokyo. Fits in nicely with the time slots, Crowley. But yeah, so... We love sport, don't we? Don't we? Sure do. Absolutely. That. And Simo's our PE teacher at school, so you'll have Simo. that up on the big screen. Simo. Oh, yeah, yeah, big screen. Ready to go do you know what else he's going to have on the big screen? He's going to have Crowey's strength session that we just did <laughs> from the runner's red zone. He's going to have that. And we're going to get Crowey in for a runner's session. So I can just Excellent. wax lyrical about the great man. Well, speaking of a runner session, Rick, oh, we've good come to segue. the because Josh and I we're being dying to be on a runner session. And oh we're, yes, we're, we're hoping that you could give us a phantom call of like a. I don't know if you've ever heard that uh, the Dylan Friends episode where with Rex Hunt. It's one of the best things you've ever heard. <laughs> no, I haven't heard it. It's Rex Hunt to do a phantom call. Oh no, brilliant! So we thought because you're such a gun at you know talking ad lib. Ad lib, bloody hope this is ad lib. So imagine it's the last <laughs> five seconds of a runner session where Josh and I have pushed through the paint. And we're hoping that you could uh, put a couple of your quotes in. <laughs> One of them's maximal. Jesus. You've got to keep maximal in there. Uh, Fast, not forced. Is that, is that what um, it is? No, that's it. Yeah, is that, is yeah. that one of your quotes? I've heard you say it again. Okay, maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, you don't have to. I'll just use whatever. What was the, <laughs> the other one we had? Oh, what have you got there? What was the other one? It was, oh, don't let fatigue make, make a count. count. <laughs> that one's not mine. That's Prefontaine's, but all right, all right, all right. So what have we got? 20 seconds to go. Whatever, yeah, this whatever. is our last training session before the Melbourne Half Marathon. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, all right. So we're six, day, six days out from Melbourne, I reckon. We're just doing this session. Right, right hey, 20 seconds to go now. Hey, 40 minutes in. Make sure now we do not get in the car and wish we had have gone that little bit harder. We pull the trigger now, Crowy. We kick now. Simo, do not let fatigue make a cow out of you. Do not be soft. Ready? Let's go. Kick now. Maximal Crowy kick again. Do not let it happen. Do not let it happen. All the pianos are jumping on the back, Simo. Do not, do not succumb. Do not succumb. Hold the hand on the fire. Hold it. Hold it. Recover. <laughs> that was, oh, sorry, boys. That, that, uh, put you on the spot there. Let's cut that. We'll do that again. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Maybe play a, play a real one on your YouTube channel. No, that was, that was very, uh, very rushed. But yeah, no, you boys have been a pleasure. I feel like, um, Let's talk another hour, eh? What are, what are we doing? <laughs> nah, Joe, it's been, it's been good. What have we got there? It's no, cool. that, that brings us to the end, mate. It's um, been awesome to sit down and chat and hear all about runners and your journey, and I'm certainly feeling inspired. I'm sure learners will be the same. Just yeah. chat the runners on and go for maybe an easy run today and a harder <laughs> run later on in the week. So you're already learning. That's it. <laughs> this is awesome. No, thank you, boys. Uh, thanks for coming down and awesome. It's just good to chat about, um, obviously, about helping... Um, different humans listen one person will take something out of it someone will take something else out of it um, and you guys do a great job on the show like it is great to have different educators from all around Australia and it's I reckon you're really blazing a trail for different teachers and and learners I'm um, sorry teachers and leaders in general and where can we find you mate runners.com yeah runners.com are you double mate and the red zone's all on there so it's very easy to find um, but yeah, but again, appreciate your time, um, and no doubt we'll get the two of you on a session. But for all the listeners, you'll be able to follow their journey towards the Melbourne Half Marathon in fourteen <laughs> weeks as well. And all the best for the upcoming child, Simo. And thanks, thanks for your time on the Strength Video, Crowy. Uh, thanks, Rick.